Welcome back to this series of videos on creating your own STM32 based PCB designs using Altium Designer. In the previous few videos, we looked at the buck converters, choosing components, the microcontroller, and more. In this video, we'll continue with our schematic design, looking at implementing an inertial measurement unit and hooking that up to a microcontroller, as well as adding a GPIO header. After that, we'll then annotate our schematics and perform an electrical rules check, which means in the next few videos, we'll then be able to move on to PCB layout and routing. Make sure to follow along, and to help you do that, please check out the link in the description below to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. Let's get started. So back in Altium Designer, in the previous video, we looked at hooking up a microcontroller, specifically this STM32F0 type. We looked at the external crystal with the load capacitances, we looked at adding decoupling and bypass capacitors, as well as filtering on the VDDA line, and some various other pins, and our serial wire debug header. We still have a couple empty schematic pages, but we can pretty soon move over to PCB layout and routing. In this video, we're going to fill in this empty page, which is the peripheral page. If we look back at our block diagram, we can see we've added the USB-C connector, we've added the microcontroller, the buck converter, and we're missing our last part, which is this sensor. I've chosen in this case an inertial measurement unit, so a motion sensor, which we can connect via SPI to the microcontroller. And it's also fed via the same 3.3 volts that the buck converter generates from the USB-C supply. I'll also add a peripheral connector so we can see how to expose additional pins and how we can do a connector pinout, for example. The inertial measurement unit or the sensor I've chosen for this example is the BMI-088 from Bosch. And I've used this sensor several times before. It contains a three-axis accelerometer and a three-axis gyroscope. We can scan through the data sheet and you'll need this to create your own footprint libraries and footprint symbols. And also further down in the data sheet, usually you will find a typical application schematic. One might be for SBI and another for I2C. For sensors, and typically I prefer SBI connections, where we need a minimum of four pins, the clock, master out, slave in, master in, slave out, as well as a chip select. We can also have these interrupt pins hooked up to our microcontroller. So for example, these could be set to be data ready interrupts. Whenever the accelerometer presents a new measurement, one of these pins will fire high or low, depending on how it's set up, and we can trigger a read on the microcontroller, for example. Of course, we also need to attach power and ground, as shown, and provide suitable bypassing. So in the first video, I showed that I have some libraries already pre-made by myself, which contain various footprints and symbols. And this also includes the BMI 088. So make sure to check out the link in the description below, get access and download those libraries in case you want to use them. We can go to the peripheral page now and then click on the bottom right on components, select our library and then look for BMI 088 and then drag that in or right click in place. We can rearrange the text to make it just a tiny bit neater. And then we go over to our data sheet we will be using SPI mode. So we have, as before, more signals than the I2C, but it's a more robust interface, generally speaking. We'll also hook up two of the interrupt pins, one for the accelerometer and one for the gyroscope. And I'll show you how to do the pinout with STM32 Cube IDE, which we saw in the last video. You can see there's actually two SDO pins here, so two slave data outputs. And this is because for this BMI 088, this specific inertial measurement unit, there's actually two controllers for the accelerometer and for the gyroscope. But you can hook these data out pins together and share a common clock so you don't have to use an additional SPI master, so to speak. You simply start a transaction then by pulling either accelerometer or chip select gyro low. The PS pin is a mode select pin, so P, pulling PS to ground selects SPI mode and pulling this to the VDD voltage selects I2C mode. Other than that, we just have power and ground. You can have separate core and IO voltages, but as with the microcontroller, we'll tie these both to 3.3 volts. So let me just transfer the schematic over to Altium Designer. Okay, so now I've just transferred the schematic from the data sheet. You can see I've added two decoupling capacitors, one per VDD or VDD IO pin. I've used two interrupts, so one for the accelerometer, one for the gyroscope. I've always labeled my net, so I've placed a net label. And then I've also placed a port because I'd like to interconnect that to a different schematic page in a few moments. PS tied low because we want to use SPI mode and the NC or the not connected pin can be tied low. On the other side, we have our SPI bus, all named as well as our chip select signals as well. And that's all there is to this schematic of this peripheral. However, we need to, of course, connect this to the pins on the microcontroller. So again, let's open up STM32 Cube IDE and select some suitable pins. So back in STM32 Cube IDE, where we did the start of our pinout last time, 
Let's add SPI. So again, either we can click on a pin and choose a specific function, which can be quite slow. So my preferred way of doing that is going into the tab on the left, connectivity, click on SPI, mode, and we want a full duplex master, meaning we can send and receive at the same time. And this selects some pins for us. So the clock, master in, slave out, and master out, slave in. However, there's no chip select signal set yet. In case you want to change the pin, so we can map this pin maybe to a different pin, we can control click. You can see that black flashing pin at the top is an alternate pin for the clock, for example. We can do the same for the master in, slave out, or the master out, slave in. So we could move all of these pins to PB3 to PB5, in case our routing is easier that way. Usually I'll just start with a very rough pin out, and while I lay out and route my PCB, I can see if I can make some various pin out changes in my microcontroller to make my routing easier. So let's just start with this. But we do need to still add two chip select signals, and these can just be GPIO outputs, and we can toggle them with software. So I'll just choose PA2 as a GPIO output, and PA3 as a GPIO output. So let's transfer this over to the schematic. So I've added these global ports now to the microcontroller section with the relevant pins we looked at in STM32 Cube IDE. Now when you copy them over, you have to make sure that the orientations or the directions, signal directions are okay. For example, I copied over inputs because on the IMU page, the chip select pins are inputs, but of course on the microcontroller, this is controlling, so these must be outputs. So to select them on the right side, select output as an IO type. And I've already done that for the other pins as well. We also said we might want to add a peripheral connector, so let's just do that now. Back in STM32 Cube IDE, for this series of videos, it really doesn't matter too much, but then again, for your own designs, you might need a UART, you might need I2C, so let's just add one of those. Let's go with I2C, so I can click on the I2C peripheral and select I2C to enable it, and it selects PB6 as the clock and PB7 as the data pin. So let's transfer that over and then add a connector. So to PB6, PB7 on our microcontroller page, I've added again net names and a port for SCL and SDA, and I'll add the connector just on the peripherals section. With I2C, what we also can't forget that this protocol or this interface has open drain drivers, meaning that we need to attach pull-up resistors both to the SCL and SDA lines, so one per bus and one per line. Typically, we'll tie this to the system voltage, so in our case, 3.3 volts, with suitable resistors. Suitable meaning 10K or below, down to even one kilo ohm is fine if you want to run the I2C bus at higher speeds. I went for this happy medium at 5.1 kilo ohms. 5.1 kilo ohms, again, because we're doing bomb consolidation, we don't want to start using many different resistor values because that will increase the number of unique components in our bit of materials, which will increase our assembly cost. On the peripherals page, I'm just going to use a standard JSTGH connector. So I'll just place that somewhere on the schematic. I'll add power and ground. And I've hooked up the remaining pins like so. And you might wonder why so many are connected to ground. It's always good for any power pin as well as any signal pin to provide a return current or return path also in the connector. That means placing a reference. In usual cases, this will be a ground connection right next to or adjacent to the power or signal pin. In this case, we get better EMI performance, better coupling of fields, and better signal integrity. For example, 3.3 volts has a reference as ground, the SCL has ground next to it, and SDA has ground next to it. Of course, this does increase the pin count of your connector, but it's typically a good thing to do, and something you don't see very often in designs. In any case, I've hooked up SCL and SDA to our connector. So you could do this with any peripheral, so UART or anything along those lines depending on what you want to connect. Of course, you could connect I2C or UART to onboard peripherals as well. This is simply for demonstration purposes. We're pretty much almost done with our schematic, but just looking through it, looking at all these pages, there's several things that we could definitely improve on. There's overlapping text. We haven't annotated the, the we haven't annotated any of these component symbols. We've left this title block blank. We haven't provided any sort of description of the schematic pages and so on. So this would be my next step, of course, after checking the schematic, making sure everything is in order, that we clean up a schematic a tiny bit. Just a note, again, for the connector, you should provide decoupling, also the power pin, you provide ESD protection and filtering in commercial level designs. This is simply for demonstration, so keep that in mind. The way I, for instance, would clean up my schematic is place bounding boxes around certain sections. The way I can do that and my keyboard is press P, then D, which is drawing tools, and then L, which is line. Then I click space to change orientation and I just draw a bounding box around certain regions. And we have a nice little bounding box around our inertial measurement unit. 
If I want to place text, I can press P and then T to place a text string. I can place it down, right click to cancel, double click to change the text. For example, inertial measurement unit, and then maybe how it's connected to the microcontroller. I can change the font, maybe not comic sense, font colors and so on. And this way, it's not only good to give titles, but you might also say, okay, why did I pull PS pin seven down? Give yourself an explanation so you don't always have to dig through data sheets if you might come back to some design like this in a year or two, or if other people are reviewing your design. For us, we're just gonna add the bare minimums, and I'll just try and clean up the schematic and then walk you through the changes I did. So I'll see you in just a second. I've made some minor changes. I've added on each schematic page, first of the schematic page number. This will be useful when we come to PCB layout and routing, and I'll show you with annotation in just a second. So power, then I've added a small subtitle for each block. I've made a bounding box. I've filled in parts of this title block. Of course, you can add, you know, sheet one of something, drawn by and so forth. What we now have to do is do the overview page. How do these various individual schematic pages tie together? The way you can do that is go to the top bar design and then create sheet symbol from sheet. Then I'll choose, let's say my first sheet, power, click OK, and I'll draw a box in. So left click to place. So now I've placed my power section on my overview page. On the left hand side, you can see it's now grouped underneath this overview section. So power is grouped under overview. I can adjust my sheet size and rearrange these texts a tiny bit more. And we can also see what port connections are on the relevant schematic pages. If I do the same thing, design, create sheet symbol from sheet, microcontroller, I'll add that in. I can of course resize and then I'll drag these around. And then later, the last step, we'll then connect these together and create interconnectivity between schematic sheets. I've now added these three sheets and noticed, and this is quite a good check, that IMU interrupt pins we actually haven't hooked up yet. So let's retroactively do that. And then we can also update this schematic sheet to include those interrupt pins. So in STM32 cube IDE, again, we can choose two interrupt pins. I'm just gonna choose PB0 and PB1, and I'll select GPIO XI0, which is my external interrupt, and XI1 for that one. And then update the schematic. Back in the overview section, I can go to design, synchronize sheet entries and ports, select the two missing port entries and click add sheet entries. Then I can just place them on my sheet. There we go. And that's how you would add missing pins in case you've forgotten something or made a mistake. Finally, all we have to do is use the wire command to hook up these connections, just like so, and all of these. There we go. Now for more complicated projects, of course, this will provide a really great help in seeing what part of the schematics are interconnected with what. We don't just have to use these wires, we could also use buses or harnesses and more advanced features in Alta Designer. For our purposes, this is just demonstration and a way to show how we can subsection our schematic and our designs. Now we've basically provided interconnection between all of our schematic pages, the last thing we have to do before we can move over is do an electrical rules check after we've annotated our components. Annotation means we have to assign numbers to each of our schematic symbols. For instance, on page one, our first connector would start a J1, J10, or J100. When having multi-page schematic sheets, I prefer going in the order of 100s. So my first connector would be 100, my first capacitor would be C100, my next one C101, C102, and so on. Then on page two, I would start from 200. So capacitor C200, C201, C202, and so on. And this is great for multi-page or very many page schematics, because when I go to PCB design, if I'm looking for C203, I know, oh, in the schematic, I just have to go to page two to find that component. I find this is really helpful for larger designs. Now you saw we could simply double click on one of these values and then just type in the designators ourselves. But of course this is rather tedious, can lead to errors and can be rather annoying if you remove or add components. Therefore, a better way of doing that is using Altum Designer's built-in annotation tools. We go to the top toolbar, tools, annotation, and then annotate schematics. Now there's various options we can do here. We can sort in various directions. We can do it depending on various parameters of the schematic symbols and so on. What we need to set to start the indices for various schematic pages is the designator index control, which you can see in the center here. We can select our three main schematic pages. So the power microcontroller and peripheral and the start index. And then you can fill in the start index. So that's either from one, two, and three, or in our case, 100, 200, and 300. So once you've done that, you can click on update changes list, accept changes again, execute changes, close and close. And now we can see we've started in the hundreds.
We also see sometimes the ordering can be kind of messed up and those are those settings we have in that annotation window. For example, we've done a start at the top and move down left to right. So that's why these components that are higher up, for example, these resistors R100 and R101 are labeled first before R102 and R103 over here. And that's kind of a preference thing and it takes a bit of fine tuning to adjust. In either case, once you've annotated your schematics and you're happy with that, we have to perform an electrical rules check. This is a way of letting your ECAT software out in designer Make sure we haven't done any careless mistakes, that all pins are connected that we want connected, that we don't have overlapping components and off-grid pins and so forth. The way we can do that is go on the left side into our projects panel, right click on our project and click validate PCB. You can see one of these windows has now popped up and this is the messages window. If you don't see that, go to the bottom right panels and click on messages. If we click on one of these errors, it's saying this certain net contains multiple output pins. So we're tying multiple outputs together. Usually that would probably be an error because you don't want two drivers driving the same line at the same time. However, the way this IC works is that both of these lines won't be driven at the same time, so we can ignore this error. To get rid of this ERC error, we press P, V for directives, and then N for generic no ERC, and pop that on the net. Right click to cancel, go back to projects, right click and run another ERC, go to messages, and we see the error is gone. We do have a couple of warnings, and a lot of these arise from connecting, for example, outputs to an I.O. port. For a lot of microcontrollers, you can have input or output on the same pin, and that, of course, is a conflict with saying an I.O. is connected to just an output. But these are just warnings and not errors. But it always pays off to go through these lists of warnings and errors and make sure everything's correct before you move on. Now we're pretty much done with the schematic, and we're ready to move on to PCB layout in the next video. Well done for making it through this video. I hope you followed along in real time on your own design. In the next video, we'll finally get to PCB layout, which for me, in addition to PCB routing, is usually the most fun part. We'll see how to set up a board, change the layer stack, adjust our design rules, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.